It's a joy to be with all of you today. It was a joy to be in the, uh, with the brothers and sisters in the uh, testing. Can you hear me okay? Am I all right? Okay. Um, it was uh, great to be with the brothers and sisters in the uh, Cantonese service uh, and, uh, and enjoyed that time together. And I'll tell you, it, uh, I reflected with them a little bit, as I'll do with you. Uh, it's, uh, it was about two years ago that I was first uh, attending here for the, f- the first time uh, I- here at Walnut, and that was with um, Louise Lowe, and uh, she, I, I came as her guest, and I was so touched by the service, uh, the ministry of the Word, and uh, just the fellowship of the believers here. And uh, I'd been introduced uh, to you by, uh, and to Louise by uh, Reverend uh, Dr. Brent Fulton. And Brent and I are good friends, and uh, we get together in Hong Kong often. Uh, And uh, I have a lot to thank him for now, because uh, Walnut's uh, supporting me. (laughs) So thank you very much. Thank the Lord. I thank the Lord first, and thank you. Thank you for your prayer support, for your care, for your financial support. Uh, Pastor Wilson has uh, taken me to Deem Sum in Hong Kong. So thank you, Pastor Wilson. So, uh, Pastor Wilson, now I think we've set up, I think you're going back there. I don't know if he's in the service here, but I guess so. Testing once, are you here? No? Okay, but I'll, I, I, it's now my turn to invite him. He's coming out at the end of this month, uh, and I'll see him for, for a day or so, so I look forward to that. And uh, Galen has been in touch with me as he's been over there, and we've had great fellowship on the phone. So, thank you so much. I get emails from some of you, and you're interested. If you'd like to get my email prayer uh, letter... Uh, just let me know, hand me a card or your email address or something, and I'll be happy to put you on that. But thank you very much for your kindness, for your support, and I praise God uh, with every, and thank God with every remembrance of you, as the Apostle Paul said. We're looking at uh, uh, the book of uh, 2 Timothy this morning, and uh, the reason why I'm looking at that is it's one of my favorite books, 2 Timothy, Paul uh, dealing with the, the young man Timothy and developing him as a worker. What we're involved in in systematic Asian leadership training is that training. We're training UAWs. What's UAW? Not United Auto Workers, okay. But it's unashamed approved workmen at 2 Timothy 2.15. Paul uh, told Timothy to uh, develop himself and to uh, rightly divide the word of truth and to be an unashamed approved worker of the Lord. That's what we do. And so I look uh, at, at the word of God today and with the eyes of developing and how you can pray for us as developing leaders. The title of the message is Changing Your World. Changing Your World. How many here would like to be a thermostat or would you prefer to be a thermometer? How many would like to be a thermostat? Raise your hand. How many would prefer to be a thermometer? How many just don't care? (laughs) Okay, Pastor Jackson, I guess we're going to have to get them away, right? Okay, how about, what's the difference between a thermostat and a thermometer? Anybody care to share? What's, what's the dip? Thermostat, what does a thermostat do? It d- what affects the temperature. What about a thermometer? It measures and shows the temperature, right? A, thermos, a, a, a thermometer shows what the environment already is. A thermostat changes the environment. I'll ask a question again. How many would like to be a thermometer? Raise your hand. Look, Pastor Jack, look for good. Okay, how many would like to be a thermometer? I, I mean, a thermostat. <laughs> it's getting late. How many, <laughs> how many would like to be a thermostat? Raise your hand. Okay, why? You can change. Change your world. Change your world. And I deeply believe that's why the Apostle Paul, there in prison, writing and ha- heading off to glory fairly soon, writes to Timothy, and he encourages this young man, and he is saying in 2 Timothy 2, 2, these things that I've taught you, Tim, I'll call him Tim today, these things I've taught you you, in the presence of many witnesses, you teach faithful ones who will be able to teach others also. In other words, get the training going, train others to train others to train others, and train them in what? The Word of God. Because it's through knowing the Word of God, embracing the Word of God, that we can change our world. Amen? I have a little bit of a habit to say amen. Amen says, I agree with the Word of God, but also it's to keep you awake a little bit too. (laughs) Okay, so 
changing our world. And Paul says in 2 in Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to be going through major portions of chapter 1 fairly quickly this morning. And he says in verse 13, he tells Timothy, What you heard from me keep as a pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And so Paul is telling Timothy, the Word of God and training others in the Word of God is how you can be a thermostat and change and affect your world. We want to embrace that too. And we want to be people who change the world. This is Paul's final pep talk to Timothy, a man that he called his son in the faith, and he wants to pass on the baton. Now, I saw in... Um, the, the last service, and I, I don't know if I'm stealing, stealing any thunder, but related to the candidate, is that correct? Okay. That in the last service, I was sitting by Brother George, who was my interpreter, and I saw this PowerPoint come up. And there's a picture in the PowerPoint. You, they'll see it, I guess, right? Okay, excuse me for stealing the thunder. Right? But it has a hand reaching out, and what does that hand have, Pastor Jackson? in it? A baton. And it's handing it over to another hand. And that's what we do in SALT. We're passing the baton, the pattern of sound teaching, equipping other leaders in other parts of Asia to take the pattern of sound teaching and pass it on to others. So I said to, to George, I said, wow, that's great. I, I'd like to get a hold of that PowerPoint, that picture, because that's what it is. And Paul is telling Timothy that I want you to take what I have and I want you to pass it on by the power of the Holy Spirit. What does that have to do with walnut? What does that have to do with Hacienda Heights? I mean, what does that have to do with L.A.? A lot. Amen? A lot. That you, as, as people hungry for the word of God, you have trained pastors here, they are passing the baton of the truth to you and equipping you and spending time with you. And you're spending time in the word to, so that you can be changed by God's spirit in your life. And, you know, listen closely. Changed people change people. Amen? Now, that change, we know, comes by the power of God himself. So it isn't us doing and affecting the change in, in carnal efforts. But it is God at work. Peter, Peter, the denier, the runoff, and then what bitterly after, after, he, after he knew what he had done. He was changed. Pentecost, he was a different man on the other side of the resurrection. And he was affected and used to, to change so many people. The Apostle Paul knocked onto the ground on the way to Damascus, carrying those letters to beat up all those Christians and persecute them. And Jesus, by that miraculous light, knocked him on the ground, and he changed him. And that changed man became one who, even to this very day, through the inspiration of the Word of God that he wrote, touches and changes us. Changed people change people. Pray that God would use the Word as we train others, as we train pastors in Asia that they would be touched, affected, not by what we're doing, but by the word of God that they too, in turn, can be changed. And I'm going to ask us today to look and apply this not only to training leaders in other parts of the world, but into your own life as well. And that is, how can we change the world? Paul pointed to a few things, a few directions he said, Timothy, you should look. So if you look at your notes uh, in, the, in your bulletin, I'm going to read the first five verses, first of all, 2 Timothy. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 3. I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience as night and day. I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears. I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. Read with me verse three, please. Uh, verse 5, please. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Paul is telling Timothy, Paul is telling him, listen, son, I want you, to, you can be a part of affecting and taking that baton of truth and touching other lives, but look first, look at your roots. Chinese would say, bu ya wang ben. Don't forget your roots. Don't forget, don't forget, well, he's specifically saying, don't forget your mom and your grandma. Don't forget your parents, I think is how I put it in the bulletin today. Don't forget your family. 
Thank God, those of you who are sitting, hearing my voice now, and you reflect on a parent, a good parent, or two parents, godly parents, who could be agreeable with this, living, sincere faith. Pause right now, just in those, these seconds as you hear my voice, and send up a prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you, God, for my dad. Thank you, God, for my mom. I do. I thank God for my mom and dad. I thank God that, after, that, that, that they walked together in love of the Lord, in love of each other, 61 years. And November 26th, a day after their 61st wedding anniversary, mom went to be with Jesus. And I was able to be with her in Altoona, Pennsylvania. And I knew she could hear my voice, and I thanked her. I thanked her for her sincere faith. I thanked her for her godly example to me. And I said this to her, Mom, O oh Zion haste, thank you, O oh Zion haste. What does that mean? It meant that a number of years before, when I was studying at Nyack College in Nyack, New York, and I, had, I was pretty sure I was going to be a pastor in the United States of America for the rest of my life. God had different plans. And in a chapel, when I was a junior at college, the Lord spoke to me very clearly about crossing cultures and going somewhere else, going to be a missionary. Missionary, a missionary, wow. Yeah, a missionary. And I called my mom on the phone. I couldn't wait. She was the head of, she was with the Christian Missionary Alliance Church. They have Women's Prayer Fellowship. She was the head of the WMPF, the Women's Prayer Fellowship. I couldn't wait to call and tell my mom. I said, Mom, guess what? I'm going to be a missionary. You know what she said? That's exactly what she said. Nothing. <laughs> mom, mom, are you there? Huh? Did you hear? I'm going to be a missionary. And she said, oh, well, that's, that's great, honey. That's great. I thought, wow, this is weird. And we changed the subject and then hung up. And about two weeks later, I got another, another call from mom. She said, Steve, you know, remember that when you told me you're going to be a missionary? I don't know if you picked it up, but I, I, I wasn't really too happy about it. I said, yeah, I, I got that. Um, she said, but I'm okay now. I'm okay. She said, I was at prayer meeting the other night, and we sang a hymn. And the hymn goes like this. It might even be in the hymn book that you, you have available. It, it, the title of the, the, the song is, O Zion Haste. And she said, I sang that last verse, and the Lord spoke to me. And the verse goes like this. Give of thy sons to bear the message glorious. Give of thy wealth to speed them on their way. Pour out your soul for them in prayer victorious, and all you spend, Jesus will repay. She said, Steve, you go. God's dealt with me. She said, I was hoping we would, you would be in America somewhere as a preacher, and I could at least go and have Thanksgiving with you sometime, you know, but that wasn't going to happen. But wouldn't you know, years later, as she and dad and others prayed with their living faith and prayed and stood behind us, and I'm the oldest son, and I'm the oldest kid in the family, and it was hard to let, to let me go, but you know, one day God was good when we were missionaries at that point in Taiwan. Mom and dad came for Thanksgiving. They spent three weeks with us. <laughs> it was wonderful. And you know, there we were Thanksgiving day having a great time. We invited other missionaries. And of course, you know what Friday is. You've overeaten on Thursday, so everybody sleeps in and just sort of loafs around on Friday. I had to get up and work on my message for Sunday. So I'm in my study, and there I didn't hear her come until I felt that hand on my shoulder. But mom came in behind me. She put her hand on my shoulder. I looked up, and I could see those gleaming blue eyes and that big smile as big as the sun and tears streaming down her face. And I could know, I could sense the bitter sweetness of that, that she's glad I'm doing what God wants me to do, but yet it, it's a challenge and it hurts. And I knew the hand on my shoulder was a crucified hand. I share that today to remind us and remind myself of living faith in our parents. Our parents that share with us their sense. Mom would say we'd lose things as a little, you know, it's just, just growing up and, and I was old enough to, you know, know better, but I'd lose something and say, well, let's pray about it. Let's pray. <laughs> okay, let's pray. And we'd find it. Now let's just stop and thank God now. You know, that's living faith right there before us. 
you say to yourself, that's great for you, Steve. That's great for you, but you know what? I don't have godly parents. I don't. Neither of my parents are Christians. I have two things to say about that. Number one, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But number two, be one. Be a godly parent. Amen? Stop the cycle now and begin to launch a godly legacy right now. Amen? And say, whatever it was in the past is the past. But Jesus, by his spirit, is speaking to me this day, and I will be one who is a parent with living, sincere faith. He told Tim, Paul told Tim, look at mom. Look at her sincere faith. Look at the example of that. Embrace that. Live that. What else should we do to be world changers? Not only give thanks for parents and make a decision to be one and be a godly influence as a spiritual parent to other people in other families, but the second place to look is not only, first is to look at parents and family, but look where. You look and follow along in your, in your outline. Verse 6 and 7, allow me to read that now for us. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Second place to look, Paul's telling Timothy, is to look within. Look at the gifts that God by his spirit gave you and serve and stir them up fan them into flame from a small glowing ember into a fire and you know it's so encouraging to see young people to work here in this church and other places where they are taking opportunities to fan into flame the gifts that god has given them all of us should be doing that amen in whatever it is sharing the words serving teaching encouragement Whatever it is, God, by his spirit, when he entered your life as, and you were born again, he brought with him his gifts, the ones he chose that you would have. Stir them up. So Paul is saying, look within. Look within. And perhaps Paul was imagining, as a good spiritual father would, Paul was imagining what was going on in Timothy's mind. Because Timothy, as we, a number of commentators have, have surmised, we find from scriptures, probably Timothy was a little timid. Timid Timothy. Everybody say that. Timid Timothy. Timid Timothy. Say it three times. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> timid Timothy. We don't, you know, but, but he was a, maybe a bit, a bit weak, a bit in, in, in some, some ways that way. Timid Timothy. And perhaps Paul was imagining, as he's saying, come on, Tim, what, what, what the, the gifts that the God has given you. But, 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 I'm, but I'm scared. I'm scared. And he says, God hasn't given you a spirit of timidity. The King James, I sort of like the way he, uh, the King James puts it. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Amen? And you know, when we are out and we want to be world changers, it can sound real good sitting here in Walnut in this church right today. And we can say, I'm going to go and do it. But boy, when we get out there and God challenges us to use our gifts and to really touch and change people, we can get a little timid. And God says to us through his word, he says it to me today. He does. He, I trust he says it to you, that he has not given you a spirit of being timid or fear but of power and love and a sound mind. But if we do have a spirit of fear, where does it come from? It comes from the enemy, doesn't it? And one way the enemy can douse the flaming gifts of the spirit in us is to douse us with fear. Oh, I can't do it. I did it last time and I failed and they made fun of me and I, oh, and I, and so then we develop a file in our head, head and mind about things that fail. We need to be recounting God's victories, amen? We need to be recounting and being clear and count those blessings and remind ourselves of the victories that he gives us. You know, there was David, and he goes to Saul and say, I'll take care of that giant, let me at him. 
Oh, yeah, well, let me at least give you some armor to wear. Well, that doesn't fit, you know. But before he threw the armor at David, he's, David, what are your qualifications? He, what the, you remember what he said? When I was out there and I was, I was a shepherd watching those sheep, and a bear came, I killed it with my bare hands. And a lion came, I killed it with my bare hands. And the same God who helped me slay the lion and the bear will help me slay that uncircumcised Philistine. How about your and my journeys? Those pathways, are they littered with slain lions and bears? Victories of the past that give us courage to stir up the gifts for today. You know, as we're training uh, leaders, I'm involved in a lot of mentoring. So pray for me as I do coaching and mentoring. And it's more of an art than a science. It really demands, it's not only hard work, it's heart work. You know what I mean? To really be sensitive to each and every personality and to encourage them. It isn't just saying, come on, let's go, get moving. No, it, it, it has to be a sensitivity of the spirit. And, you know, we have a dear sister who uh, grew up in Asia, came and moved to North America, came to Christ. She now has a burden uh, to, to be um, a trainer. And she now has raised her support as part of the team. And she's over there in Hong Kong. She's been there for three weeks. It's a miracle that over, within a year she raised all of her support. But she was so timid about that. But the Lord helped her. And now pray. Pray that I would have wisdom as a mentor, as a coach, to continue to encourage her as it were out over the edge of the boat. You know what I mean by that? Timothy, uh, not Timothy, Peter. Out over the edge of the boat to take those risks and steps and encourage this dear sister as well as other brothers and sisters who are now starting to do training in Asia to encourage them to see their gifts. God hasn't given us a spirit of timidity but of power and love and self-control. A Spanish proverb goes like this, I, I have heard. A life lived in fear is a life half-lived. Would you agree with that? I would. A life lived in fear is a life half-lived. May God release us. May God give us a spirit of boldness. As Paul challenged Timothy, live a life of power and love and a sound mind. We're mentoring some teachers who are in country. They are born, bred, and raised in country, and they are, they are a part of training systems, and they now are a part of what we are doing, and we need your prayers that with those people we work with shoulder to shoulder, that they too would be emboldened and stir up the gifts that God has given them. Look at parents, look within, stir up the gifts in a fearless, bold manner. Thirdly, to be a world changer. Where else do we look? Look at verse 8 to 12. So don't be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace, this grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And this, of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet... I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and I'm convinced that he's able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. Amen? Amen. Where to look? Not just looking at parents and those being gone before us, not just looking within at the gifts, but look at Jesus. And I'll tell you, thank you, worship team. Thank God working through you, singing these songs. This about Jesus uh, uh, conquering death, the risen Savior. We should never take these songs and this truth for granted. Amen? 
that it is truly Jesus. And pray for us as we train, that we would train and share the true Jesus. Part of Asia says Jesus has returned. The Bible says Jesus is coming back, amen? Charlatans have come along and twisted the truth and said, yep, yeah, he's, he's already back. And he's a woman. And her last name is Dung. D-E-N-G. That's, that's her last name. And, and, and it's called the Eastern Lightning Cult because it's in the east. And as lightning sh flashes from the east, so will the Son of Man appear. The Bible says that. He said the lightning has already flashed. It's eastern. And people are being duped by this cult because they are preaching the false Jesus. Pray for us. Pray that we would uh, share the sound pattern of sound teaching and the clear person of the living Jesus as recorded in the Bible. Pray that we would do it fearlessly. Pray that the communication would be clear in whatever language is being used. And pray that by His Spirit, those people, as they hear this teaching, would embrace the living, risen Christ. We need to be challenged. I need to challenge myself to keep gazing upon the living Jesus. Continuing to fall in love with Him being totally committed to him and preaching him and his truth. Paul told Timothy here, don't be ashamed. One of the passage I just said, don't, don't be ashamed of Jesus. There are a few times that he's, when he writes to Tim about this timidity, and he also says, don't be ashamed. Don't, 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 don't hide it. Don't be ashamed. And so my final point is here Paul points now to an example, a living godly example at that, in that day and age that Timothy could see and in that way be inspired to be an unashamed world changer. And so we go on to verse 15. Verse 15 to 18. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phygelus, and Hermogenes. Verse 16. May the Lord show mercy to the household of Anesphorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. Here's a guy, you notice? He's pointing out, say, here's Anesphorus. He's not ashamed. He's an example. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. But I continue to verse 1 of chapter 2. You then, so then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So he holds out another example, and I call this example the persevering saints. Saints that persevere and hang in there and never give up. Who was the one who never gave up? It was this guy, Onesphorus. So that Paul says, may God show mercy to him and his family. Why? Because you know what? I'm in jail in Rome, and he looked for me. And he looked for me after a while. He said, can't find him. I'm out of here. My time's up. He didn't do that. He searched hard. How did he search hard? I don't know. Prison to prison, knocking, asking around, asking questions. He searched hard for me until he found me. He was persevering. He did not give up. And I deeply believe that the Apostle Paul is using Arnesphorus as an example and holding it out and saying, Tim, don't give up. I would say it to myself today as I read this and remind myself as I'm preaching. Steve, don't give up. Don't let it go. Pastor Wilson, has anybody been in his office and seen he has a little uh, sign there? I took a look at it. I don't know, think I have it fully memorized, but it went something like this. Hang tough. It'll be over soon. <laughs> Hang tough. It'll be over soon. I want to encourage you to do this. Look at your, the friend beside you and say that. Hang tough. Just say it, please. Wake them up. Wake them up and say, hang tough. Don't say it over soon. Well, the, the message will be over soon, so <laughs> hang tough. Hang tough. It'll be over. <laughs> but the point is this. The point is this. Oh, okay, that's enough. Thank you. <laughs> Onesphorus 
was a brilliant example of not giving up. He hung tough, you know? And I challenge me, and I challenge you today, don't give up. Don't slide for home. Oh, we're, you know, don't, 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 don't say, well, it's just about done so much. Boom, when I'm done. No. Paul didn't do it, you know? He told Tim later on in, in 2 Timothy, you know? I've run the race that's set before me. I've kept the faith. I've done, done this, whatever's been set before me. We need to challenge each other. If we're to be world changers by the power of God's Spirit, we don't do it in the short term. Why? It's a marathon. Amen? It's not a 100-yard dash. It's a marathon. Talked to a gentleman today in the back of the church. Said, how long have you been here? Said, came with the, the, the church plant. And with a big smile on his face, he said, thank God for what he's been doing here. That's Pastor Jackson sharing that with me. I guess, I, you know, I'd have to say, it's a marathon man. Amen? He's a marathon man. You know why he's a marathon man? Excuse me, but you know why he's a marathon man? Because we have a marathon God. Amen? He's the one with us, walking us through, running us through, going through the tough times. About five, six years ago, I hit a hard patch, dark patch. It was low for me emotionally. It was very tough. But I thank God for the persevering saints who, who called me up, who wrote me an email, who looked me up by the power of the Lord and, and spoke into my life. You and I need to be persevering saints to others to encourage them to hang in. I stand here, number one, by the grace of God, but I stand here, too, because of persevering saints who stood around me and held me up. Why? Not because they're marathon men or women, but it's because we have a marathon God. I'm so glad for that. I'm so glad for that. And don't give up. Because it'll be over soon. I close with this. There was a pastor in what I understood to be the middle part of uh, the States, and he was visiting an elderly woman in his congregation. And uh, he had visited her on a regular basis. And uh, this particular visit was like none other. She said, Pastor, today I would like to talk about my funeral. And he said, what? He said, yes, I would like to talk about my funeral. I'd like you to take some notes. And so he said, okay. She said, when I am there, I want to wear my nice blue dress. You know, the one I wear to church? Often, yes, I want to wear that. I want in my right hand, uh, my left hand, hold my Bible. And she patted her Bible. I want that in my left hand. And in my right hand, I want you to put a fork in my right hand. A fork. So the pastor's taking these notions. And, okay, I understand the dress and the Bible but why the fork? She said, Pastor, you know at our church we have those dinners, and I love those dinners. And uh, she said, whenever we're eating and we're about finished with the main course and we clean off the tables and the ladies come and are cleaning it off, and they tell me to save my spoon, she said, I know what's coming is pudding or ice cream or something. She said, I don't really care for that. But if they clean off the table and they tell me to save my fork, then I know something's coming like cake or pie. And I love that. And so when they tell me to save my fork, I know the best is yet to come. And so, Pastor, as people filed by my casket and they ask why the fork, you tell them. The best is yet to come. Persevere, my friend. Persevere as a world changer because the best is yet to come. Amen? 
we will be with him in glory. And many of those people that God has you you have been used by the Lord to touch and change in one way or the other, you will see and you won't be getting glory for yourself, but will have glory for Jesus, the risen one. Amen? The best is yet to come. Let's pray for each other that we keep changing our world for his glory. Let's pray. God in heaven, we pray for your spirit to enable and interpret to us what you want to say to us personally in the own, our own personal altar in our soul. Bless this time, bless your word, continue to bless your word. Bless this dear church and continue to use the brothers and sisters here to change their world. In Jesus' name.